A few months ago, I had the chance to drive the new Volvo EX30. I wrote a review about it for theautopian.com and noted that the car is based on a platform from parent company Geely called the Sustainable Experience Architecture. This platform uses a new type of brake booster supplied by Bosch called the Integrated Power Brake, or IPB, which some have referred to as a brake-by-wire system. I got a lot of feedback from people who would never buy a car with a brake-by-wire system because they wouldn't trust what might happen if there is a failure in the system. I understand those fears, but today I would like to talk about how these systems actually work and hopefully allay the fears some of you might have as well. Hello everyone, I'm Hubert Mace and this is Suspensions Explained. Before we dig into the inner workings of the Bosch IPB and other similar brake systems, we need to talk about why these systems even exist. What's wrong with the traditional brake system like we've had for decades? The answer is absolutely nothing. But cars are changing, and in particular, powertrains are evolving and getting more diverse. We don't just have internal combustion engines anymore, but we now have electric cars and hybrids, and with these new powertrains, the brake systems are having to change too. What is forcing this is a characteristic of electric vehicles and hybrids which sets them apart from old internal combustion engines, and that is the ability to regenerate electricity. Electric motors have the ability to generate electricity temporarily, and in doing so provide a resistance that can be used to help slow the car down. You can get a little bit of something similar in an internal combustion engine through engine braking, but it is very small, and you're not creating gasoline in the process, are you? The vast majority of deceleration in a traditional car is done through the hydraulic brakes, and all you're doing there is converting the energy of motion into heat. The brake pads heat up the brake rotors, and in the process slow the car down. All that energy is lost to the air. EVs and hybrids take a portion of that energy, convert it into electricity, and store it in a battery. Let me explain that a little better. All objects that are in motion have something called kinetic energy. It's the energy of motion and it follows this formula. Kinetic energy is equal to the mass of the object, in this case a car, times its velocity squared. Notice that velocity term. The amount of kinetic energy an object has is related to how fast it is moving. Slow something down and you will reduce its kinetic energy. By the same token, if you reduce the kinetic energy, you will slow the object down. Traditional braking systems reduce the kinetic energy of a car by converting it into heat energy. EVs and hybrids do by converting as much of it as possible into electricity. The effect is the same. Reduce the kinetic energy and you slow the car down. But there are limits to how much electrical power a motor can generate, and this means there are limits to how much it can slow the car down. There are a number of reasons for this. The motor may just not be very powerful, or the battery may not be able to accept the charge the motor is creating, either because it is already full or because there are limits to how fast a battery can be charged. The end result is in order to slow the car down as much as the driver needs, regen may need to be combined with hydraulic brakes. Ideally, this will be done in a way that is completely transparent to the driver. At no point should they be aware that either regen or hydraulic brakes are being used or how much of each. The brake pedal should always feel the same no matter what is happening under the floor. There's another thing we need to talk about before digging into these systems, and that is terminology. Many people refer to these systems as brake by wire, but that is not really the right term to use. While they do use wires as a fundamental part of their functionality, a true brake by wire system would have no hydraulics and only wires running from the brake pedal and booster down to the four wheels. The pedal would have some sort of position sensor, and the calipers would have some sort of electric motors actuating the brake pads. A computer would translate the pedal position sensor signal into electrical current flowing out to the caliper motors to tell them how hard to push on the brake pads. These systems exist in aircraft, but not in cars, except in some early prototypes. The brake systems we are talking about here are not that. 
There are still hydraulic lines and hoses going from the booster to the calipers, and the pedal still pushes on a fairly traditional master cylinder. The difference is that now there are actually two hydraulic systems involved, separated by valves. When the valves are closed, the two systems are disconnected or decoupled from each other, and that is really the right term to use here. We shouldn't call these systems brake by wire, but rather decoupled. Save the term brake by wire for a time in the future when we will have truly electric brakes with no hydraulics at all. So what do I mean by two hydraulic systems separated by valves? Here is the view of the Bosch IPB with the main components being the reservoir, an interface plate where it connects to the dash panel, the input rod that attaches to the brake pedal, a hydraulic unit with the various valves that we'll get into in a minute, an electric motor, ECU, and finally, the key to the whole system, the pedal feel simulator. I'm showing the Bosch system here, but any of the others that are out there have some version of these same main components. Let's look at a schematic diagram of the inner workings of a typical decoupled system to see what all this stuff does. The brake pedal is connected to a fairly traditional looking master cylinder with two pistons, just like in every other car. The hydraulic fluid coming out of these two pistons goes through two valves, which are normally open, and flows out to the wheels via tra a traditional anti-lock brake module, not shown here. What makes these systems different is that when everything is working normally, the two valves we just mentioned are powered closed, which means the hydraulic fluid coming out of the master cylinder has no way of getting to the wheels. Instead, the fluid goes into something called a pedal feel simulator. This is a device made up of a spring and a rubber donut that get compressed by the hydraulic fluid acting on a piston. The idea is that the rubber and spring donut compress in a way that feels to the driver like a normal brake system. The pedal resistance builds in the same way as a normal brake system, so the driver thinks they are pressing on a brake like the ones they have become used to in all the other cars they've ever driven. And manufacturers can tune the spring in any way they want to give the pedal feel they want, from soft to stiff and anything in between. As the driver pushes down on the brake pedal, position and pressure sensors measure what they are doing and send signals to an ECU. At the same time, hydraulic pressure from the master cylinder flows to the pedal feel simulator, where the fluid moves a piston that compresses the spring and rubber donut. The ECU then takes the signals coming from the pressure and position sensors and translates them into electrical signals sent to a small electric motor built into the unit. This motor drives a piston in a second master cylinder hidden inside the module. Pressure from this second master cylinder is what is then sent out to the wheels via the ABS module. So far, this all sounds like a convoluted way of doing what any brake system already does. But there is another job the ECU has to do. As we talked about before, in an electric or hybrid vehicle, some of the braking can be performed by the main electric motor in the form of regen. What the brake system ECU in conjunction with the powertrain ECU has to do is decide how much braking can be accomplished by regen and how much needs to be done by ordinary hydraulics and calipers. All of that depends on a lot of factors, such as how much charge the battery already has and how hard the driver is pushing on the brake pedal. If you're only trying to slow down a little bit, the ECU might decide to only use regen. But if you need to slow down a lot, it might decide it needs to use both regen and hydraulic braking. Again, we want all of these decisions to be made in a way that is transparent to the driver. The pedal should always feel the same, no matter how much of the braking is being done by regen or hydraulics. By decoupling the brake pedal hydraulics from the main system hydraulics, what these decoupled systems do is ensure the driver only ever feels the effect of the pedal feel simulator. What the ECU is doing with regen and hydraulic brakes won't affect the simulator, so the feel will always be the same. So now that we understand how these systems work, how do we answer the concerns that many people have about computers making decisions in our brakes? Computers can fail after all, wires can break. The answer to these concerns lies in those two decoupling valves that stop fluid from the main master cylinder from flowing to the calipers. When everything is working as it should, those valves are closed, which separates the two hydraulic systems from each other. 
If, on the other hand, something happens that takes the computer offline or causes power to the unit to be interrupted, the valves spring open automatically. They are spring-loaded, so they open as soon as power is removed. When there is no power going to the unit, or if the ECU senses a fault in the system, the decoupling valves are open and the other shutoff valves are closed. When that happens, the separation between the two hydraulic systems is removed and they now work as one. This means that hydraulic fluid and pressure from the main master cylinder can flow directly out to the calipers and the system acts like any other normal braking system. Of course, it will act like any other brake system that has lost power. Any boost function will be lost, but that is no different from a vacuum boosted system that has lost vacuum because the engine has died. But even here, these systems have an advantage that is not immediately obvious. Brake systems are one of the few systems in cars that are specifically covered by government regulation. This is true throughout the world. In the US, brakes are covered by Federal Motor Vehicle Safety Standard number 135, or FMVSS 135. In Canada, it is Canadian Motor Vehicle Safety Standard 135, or CMVSS 135. Most of the rest of the world is covered by the Economic Commission for Europe Regulation number 13H, or ECER 13H. In FMVSS and CMVSS 135, there is a requirement that in case the energy source that allows the brake boost function to work is lost, the brakes still need to be able to stop the vehicle. If vacuum is lost, or if electrical power is lost, the brakes must be up to a certain specified capability. The requirement is that with a pedal effort no larger than 500 newtons, or 112 pounds, the car must be able to stop from 100 kilometers per hour in no more than 551 feet. The way brake engineers have met these requirements is by choosing a combination of master cylinder piston diameter, brake pedal geometry, caliper piston diameter, and rotor sizes that give the right braking force to meet the requirement. Ideally, you would want a relatively small master cylinder diameter so that for every pound of brake pedal force you would get a high fluid pressure. And you would want a relatively large caliper piston diameter so that the fluid pressure coming out of the master cylinder creates a large force acting on the brake pads. Unfortunately, a small master cylinder diameter combined with large caliper piston diameters would result in very long pedal travel. In order to press the brake pads against the rotors, the caliper pistons have to move slightly. If they are large, it takes more fluid to move them. That fluid has to be supplied by the master cylinder. But if the master cylinder has a small diameter, then it has to move further to supply the necessary fluid. That might be fine in a failed boost situation, but it's not fine when everything is working as it should. You don't want lots of brake pedal travel when everything is working properly. So, brake engineers must choose master cylinder diameters and caliper pistons that are a compromise in order to meet the failed boost requirements, as well as provide reasonably normal pedal travel. It's obviously possible, since every car out there does it. They couldn't be sold if they didn't. But what if there was a better way? What if that compromise wasn't necessary? A decoupled system provides just such a way. Since the only thing the master cylinder in a decoupled system is normally pushing against is the pedal feel simulator, we can make it any diameter we want. And since the only thing providing fluid to the calipers is the secondary master cylinder, we can make the caliper pistons any diameter we want. The main master cylinder and the calipers are not normally connected to each other, so a large caliper piston diameter will have no effect on the amount that the master cylinder has to travel. Because of this disconnection, we can choose a small master cylinder diameter and large caliper piston diameters, and in a failed boost situation, when the two main valves are in their open position, we will have a small master cylinder pushing against large caliper pistons. Yes, the pedal travel will be large, but that is not such a big deal when we're talking about an emergency situation. At that point, you are really just concerned with getting the car stopped and to the side of the road safely. But with these newly possible piston arrangements, you will be able to do it with much less pedal effort. So bottom line, the new decoupled brake systems, or brake by wire, as some might be tempted to call them, are really nothing to be afraid of. They work extremely well and are just as safe as traditional brake systems, even when a failure occurs.
In fact, they can be designed to be safer and easier to stop in an emergency. Thank you for watching, and if you enjoyed this video, please hit that subscribe button and check notifications, and we'll see you next time for more Suspensions Explained.